I'm Tom Spencer. These days, more and more gardens are going to the chickens. Well, it's certainly the first time they've joined us here in the KLRU studios. Today, our special guest will show you why you'll love a brood of your own. Plus, we'll explain how to get started with your own backyard coop. On tour, let's visit an artist who also wakes up with the chickens. Alicia and Joe Thornton have never regretted leaving the highways of Houston for the back roads of Lytton Springs. Since they bought their land in the woods, they've had a different viewpoint on life. My husband and I are both very handy, hands-on. We want to have room if we wanted to do a little guest house or a potting shed or whatever and not you know, have to worry about the constraints of living in a subdivision. They also wanted land for the animals they rescue, which now includes pets that get dumped along the road. In the country life, they expanded their rescue repertoire. Some new pets are simply on the job for fresh eggs. Mainly, the land gave Alicia and Joe an open field for creativity. The only thing that was here when we came out here was the house. There was a little shed and a lean-to. No, no garden, and the yard was been damaged because of the drought. After they put their stamp on the house, they surrounded it with gardens that well fit the land's character. Joe, an engineer by profession, built a barn with family and friends for his carpentry hobby. Alicia, an artist, has space to create and stage her work to take on the road, sell online, or to show clients in her outdoor studio. The guest house they moved onto the property and restored has become a venue to store Alicia's other passion for rescue, old garden art and architecture. I've always loved salvage stuff. I've always loved salvage yards. I've always loved decayed salvage things. And when I first started seeing them in gardens, people started doing them in the 80s. I just, that was, I, it immediately lit me up. I'm like, I love that. I love that look of the old gates or the old little iron pieces sitting in the yard somewhere. Everything I have, it has to be old or vintage. I don't like any new things, which is getting hard to find. <laughs> I think it just brings back that time of, you know, people sitting on the front porch and people, neighbors knowing each other and just an era that is totally gone, it seems like now. Alicia's always on the hunt, finding creative treasure in what people throw out. With imagination, she spares the landfill and gives her foundlings a new life and often a new purpose. Joe knows by now that Alicia can't resist any fine like discarded utility pipes that she turned into sculpture. Then I'll come home and he'll say, what are you going to do with that? And I'll say, I'm going to use it in the garden somewhere. He's often her sounding board as she comes up with a plan for her latest rescue. Without him, I couldn't do it. I kind of do the design and he reaffirms the design with an engineering standpoint of how it's structurally got to be and then he will build it and I usually help. I'll bring him a pie safe that's falling apart and he'll say, oh my God, I can't put that together. And I say, Joe, I know you can do it. You can do, you'll put it together beautifully. And he always does. <laughs> Alicia didn't follow a diagram to give her garden its personality. As she tells her clients, be ready to recognize a new adventure from a scavenger hunt, 
even if it's in your own garage. And don't be afraid to invent your own style. I like formal. I like the Texas style. I like the um, zero scape style. I like cottagey, and I just liked them all. And I didn't want to be confined to one, so I just put them together to do what I call funky, eclectic yard art style. Eclectic found art. That's it. Thanks for sharing your garden with us. And now we're gonna be talking about a very hot topic in the garden world and backyards everywhere. Chickens, uh, growing chickens and raising them in your own backyard with your coops. I'm joined by Judith Haller from Chicken, Funky Chicken Coop Tour. Yes. And uh, you, uh, you've had a tour in Austin of uh, chicken that coops, attracting a thousand people. At least. Which speaks, I think, to the popularity of this particular topic. But uh, everywhere I go now, I see people who are interested in, in growing their own food, uh, having uh, you know fruit trees, vegetables, whatever. It makes uh, sense that the next step is having some backyard protein. That in is the form correct. Of eggs, right? That is correct. And uh, yeah, the eggs are an absolutely wonderful treat. Once you start mm. eating fresh eggs, it's almost impossible to go back to the store-bought right. eggs. So having them in your backyard is uh, an absolute convenience. It's the best convenience food, and it's certainly about as local as you can get. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and there's so many other advantages to having chickens, though. Well, you've brought with you uh, a part of your brood of, I understand you, you, you're very new to this. You've only been doing this is for there, a couple mm -hmm. of years. That's correct. You were going to stop at three. Yes, but you're uh, up to eleven. Yeah, maybe a little <laughs> over the twelve, thirteen. <laughs> we don't know about these younger ones either. But okay. yes, it's I uh, it's a collector. <laughs> <laughs> but th th this whole kind of backyard of farming uh, thing going on is, I think, really exciting and uh, probably very rewarding for you in a lot of different ways. You, you've talked about the eggs and we'll spend more time talking about that. But uh, I, I'd like to know how you got, how you personally got started with all this. What was it that drew you to this? Well, actually I was looking to get, improve my garden mm -hmm. and I thought having my own supply of chicken manure would get me a lot more compost faster and uh, get my garden growing better. Right. I have a lot of clay in my soil, it's mm -hmm. very alkaline mm -hmm. and chicken manure is one of the best antidotes to both sure. of those problems and that's sure. very common in Austin. Mm -hmm. So uh, I got three chickens and uh, within hours of getting my first three baby chicks I was just in love with them and mm -hmm. so uh, of course I had to go out and get a few more and that led to a few more and now right. I have a flock of 12 and occasionally have some babies running around and uh, I'm getting a very nice collection of manure for my garden <laughs> of course and uh, I have a wonderful compost heap in addition to all these wonderful beautiful delicious eggs well you, the, the the ones that you brought are a colorful assortment they are and um, you and I understand that some of these are rare or actually endangered breeds yes backyard chicken keepers are taking the whole responsibility for keeping some breeds of chickens mm -hmm. um, from becoming extinct right and uh, preserving heritage breeds is uh, one of the motivators for a lot of people to even start keeping chickens in the first place uh, the blue gray chicken over there is a blue splash and illusion that uh, is what they call those uh, they're they're a Mediterranean breed they lay white eggs and um, they're very cold hardy and they do very well in the mm -hmm. heat and uh, the small bird with a double comb she has her head down right now. It's a Sicilian buttercup, and those are also an endangered uh, sweet breed. Sounding name. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got one with a punk rock hairdo that's yes. over on this side. Yeah, that one is a buff lace Polish, gender unknown. Mm -hmm. And um, he he's, seems an anxious to uh, explore the studio. Right oh, absolutely. <laughs> yes, chickens are very curious. Mm -hmm. And uh, pretty soon that one won't be able to see because of the feathers. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, they're very cute birds. They're not as good of a layer as some other breeds, mm -hmm. but they're certainly a lot of fun to look at and very entertaining. Well, they're all fun to look at, really. <laughs> and 
they all have their distinct personalities as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Right. And um, some of them are very shy, and some of them are um, very bold and gregarious mm -hmm. and sociable. Right. Uh, some of them are very aggressive foragers, mm -hmm. and they'll go out in the garden and eat all those bugs that you're trying to get rid of. Right, and that's one of the advantages of, of having chickens that do go out during the day from their coops, mm -hmm. is that they really will go over the garden and pick out the insects. Absolutely. They can, uh, I, I personally have not had a problem with cutworms mm -hmm. in most of my yard since I started letting the chickens uh, do right. a little bit of the cleanup. Right. And um, yes, they will they will dig for worms, they'll catch roaches, they'll catch mm -hmm. uh, moths and pill bugs and uh, just generally keep everything in balance for okay. you. Well, and we were talking about the eggs, and we yeah. have to show this little, it's almost like a mm -hmm. bouquet. In exactly. A sense. Aren't they beautiful? They are beautiful. And we have a variety of different kinds here, mm -hmm. some with kind of a bluish cast, and others this beautiful earth tones. Now, tell me, can you tell the difference between the eggs that you get from your backyard and those that you get from the grocery store? Absolutely. Yeah, uh, you'll notice a lot in, in your cooking. When you first break the egg into the pan, you'll notice that the yolk stays mounded. Mm -hmm. and it just stands right up. And you'll also notice that the whites are a little bit cloudy and very firm, and the egg doesn't spread out in the pan like a factory egg. Mm -hmm. And when you taste it, it's quite a bit more rich. And of course, the yolks from a backyard chicken are generally gonna be more golden or yellow because mm -hmm. the chickens have access to the outdoors, a wider variety in their right. diet, mm -hmm. uh, more corn, more beta carotene, uh, yeah, more uh, vitamin A. Right. And so um, you get a healthier, a different profile nutritionally mm -hmm. with a backyard yard egg and of course there's so much pressure you know, they're absolutely delicious yeah well the, the, the key word that you said to me there was factory mm -hmm. and that's the conditions that so many of the mm. poultry and other farm animals that we uh, we use for protein are there they live in factory uh, conditions, conditions. Mm -hmm. and so if you can spare a few animals that horror really yes uh, and have and have that source close to home and, and also have the fun of what I'm seeing right here which looks like <laughs> a lot of fun now what are the rules yeah. of, uh, if you're gonna do this in the city mm -hmm. I know there are rules about this. You're absolutely right so what what are the rules say if somebody wanted to have uh, a small coop in mm -hmm. their backyard um, wh what is allowed well, in the city of Austin, we're allowed to have a coop that has to be at least 50 feet away from our neighbor's residence. Okay. That means there has to be 50 feet of space between the corner of their house, not right. necessarily a property line. Mm -hmm. And they also ask you to cage your chickens, which is for their own safety and sure. for practicality. But uh, there is no real limit on the, roost, on the number of birds you can have. It's just a practical limitation mm -hmm. more than anything. Mm -hmm. So we're very lucky in Austin. I would mm -hmm. caution people to check with their homeowners association <laughs> because there yes. may be some additional rules. And right. um, if you're outside the city, like in Leander or Round Rock or so mm -hmm. forth, uh, you might want to check with your local government sure. to find out what the rules are because there are some variations from one locality right. to right. another. Now, uh, cooping the chickens or uh, having a, a, a secured place for them mm -hmm. to sleep, yeah. I know, is essential. Yes. Um, um, because you, predators for like raccoons or things like that mm -hmm. can easily destroy your, your population. Um, but but do you do you let yours, uh, you, it sounds like you let yours out during the day. Um, on a limited basis. Mm -hmm. Now, in my neighborhood, I have to be careful that dogs might get into the backyard, sure. um, as well as hawks. Mm -hmm. So the best thing to do is to keep your chickens confined or in a place where they're safe. Mm -hmm. um, and um, housing, if you get the housing right, chickens are very, very easy to keep. Mm -hmm. So you can have... Um, something like a small cage or something that's big enough to walk into. Mm -hmm. You can have stationary coops that are just a structure that you build in the backyard. Right. Or you can have a movable cage where you can move the chickens around the yard and let them fertilize the grass in different right. places. Okay. And um, it depends on your situation, but there's quite a, way, quite a number of ways to do it. Mm -hmm. And you can get very simple with, you know, a few pieces of plywood or you can get very elaborate I could see and, uh, people getting pretty elaborate. <laughs> I could already yes. see some envisioning architectural chicken challenges. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> yes. And you're going to have another tour in we April. We are. We are. And let's it's talk so a little exciting. bit about that yeah. because I know that, uh, that uh, there are probably a lot of people out there who would love to see what 
how folks are dealing with this. Exactly. And, and maybe it's the see best some way. of those chicken palaces. Yes, <laughs> the best way to get started with chickens is to come to the tour. It's going to be happening in April. It's on April 3rd. It's going to be the Saturday before Easter, mm -hmm. and it's from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. There's six hours there, and it's free. So mm -hmm. everybody can come. No excuses to stay home, bring your out-of-town guests okay. and everything. So it works like other garden tours. You'll, yes. There will be a map. We'll and... put a map on our website, mm -hmm. and uh, all you have to do is show up wherever you want to visit visit and stay as long as you like and move mm -hmm. on to the next one. Okay. But the tour is the best way in the world to, have, to get started because you have an opportunity to see the different materials people use, the different arrangements. You mm -hmm. have an opportunity to see a lot of different birds and to talk to people who are taking care of birds, how to feed them, how to take care of them, how to protect your garden, right. how to... Um, you know how many how many chickens you need to get the number of eggs you want mm -hmm. all these things are, a tour is a perfect place to get all those answers and we invite everybody to come well i think that's going to be a lot of fun and and, and i'm sh and one of the great things about any kind of tour is it, you do get to visit with the enthusiasts. Yes. So if you want to learn the particulars about the diet and how mm -hmm. to keep them healthy and all that kind of stuff, yes. it, it's, it's all right there. But in, the thing that I'm, I'm, I, really excites me about this is that I hope that the, uh, there are a lot of families who are doing this mm -hmm. because I think this would be wonderful for the children. It is, and children very often have never even seen a chicken until they I come know. on the, the chicken coop the, tour. The, this is their eggs first come experience. From the store, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right. So it's wonderful for kids to be able to see them in a natural environment and, okay. and see the different colored eggs. It's very exciting. And for them. where can people learn about the tour and get more information? If they well, want we to have see a it. website and it's austincooptour.org. Okay. Or you can just Google Austin Chicken Coop Tour or something okay. like that. Okay. And we should pop right up on the top all right. if we're doing everything right. And all right. we'll have all the information. Great. Well, again, uh, Judith, it's been a lot of fun. Thanks for bringing the, uh, the girls down. Oh, thank you, Tom. <laughs> and coming up next, it's Down to Earth with our friend Daphne. Hi, and welcome to Down to Earth. Our question this week is on how to water plants that you've put in your garages for the winter. With our out-of-character, harsh winter this year, a lot more of you may be bringing plants inside to get them out of that cold weather. And that's a great idea. But if we put them in our garages and they are tender plants, normally they don't require much water and they won't be growing much. So a great example is an agave plant. An agave, you can bring it into your garage and not water it the entire winter. Because it's succulent, it does tend to rot if it has too much water. And because it's not growing, it's not using the water that you've given it. So if you've got other plants that are not succulents and you're wanting to know how to water them while they're inside and not growing much, then you need to err on the side of caution and water them even less than you think you might. Maybe even once a month, or every six to eight weeks. So make sure to check those. And a great way to check them is to just pick up the container and see how heavy it is. And when you water them, water them very lightly. A lighter container means it has less water in it and a heavier container means it's full of water. So be sure to err on the side of caution for those winter plants that you've got inside. Our plant this week is the Queen Victoria agave, also known as, more officially, Agave Victoria regini. It's a great agave here for our area because it has no side teeth. It does have very sharp terminal spines at the end of each leaf, but that makes it a very nice agave for our yards for people walking around it so that it doesn't poke you in the shin or get any of your children while they're running around. It's a very compact agave, only 18 inches wide and tall. It's also very slow growing. So when you get one, they may be a little more expensive if they're larger because they're actually very old. It has tightly rosetted leaves. And a really good thing is that it's hardy down to at least 10 degrees Fahrenheit and maybe even lower. And I know we've all been planting more agaves and succulents and desert plants in our yards to take our hot summers. But we also, this winter, learned that our succulents also need to be able to take really harsh winters. Very low water on this plant, as with most succulents and desert plants, and it also needs very well-drained soil. Don't use any organic mulch around it because it does tend to rot the stem. If you do use organic mulch, make sure it's well away from the plant. It also likes full sun, and it's native to the Chihuahuan Desert, which is very close to us here in Texas, out west near the mountains of El Paso. To do this month, you need to check for insects on your indoor plants. 
So we said earlier, if you've brought some plants indoors, they may be getting insects on them. They're not growing much. They're not using much water. They may have a little more water on them. And so you do need to watch them for insects. Things like mealybugs and especially those little fungus gnats that may be around them if you've watered them too much. A great thing to do is to spray those insects with neem oil. It's an organic chemical from a tree, and so it is very safe. But as with any other pesticide, you do need to move the plants outdoors when you spray it. It's not safe for you to breathe indoors. It's also a great time to plant fruit trees. They've been available in nurseries for a while, and they are still available. You need to make sure that if you get a stone fruit, a peach or a plum, that these plants are recommended for the number of chill hours that we get in our area. They tend to flower um, at a certain time after getting a certain number of chill hours. And so if you get one that takes more or less chill hours, you will either get frozen flowers or no flowers at all. It's also great to research any replacements that you might need for any plants that are frozen. We'd love to hear from you, so send us your question or idea for Plant of the Week. Go to klru.org ctg. Thanks, Daphne. Now let's check in with Backyard Basics and Sweet Pea Hoover. Hello, I'm Sweet Pea Hoover, and welcome to Backyard Basics. Today we're going to take a glance at weeds. It's been said they are simply wildflowers that are misunderstood but I'm gonna take it a step further and try to show you that nature's trying to tell you something about the soil that you've got. Nature by nature doesn't like bare spots. It's going to try to fill it in with something. So it's then your job to tell it how much and where you would like it to be. I'd like to start with the theory about the healthy blade of grass. If you have a well-balanced lawn, it can outcompete any weed that's trying to go through it but because we were part of the weather restrictions, the watering restrictions, and the drought last season, we're having a lot of issues with bare spots this season. I'd like you to start to take a look at some of the broadleaf weeds that I found in just some samples. First one I'd like to look at is the henbit. Many people see this, it has a square stem, it's in the mint family, and it's known by its purple and pink tubular flowers that usually adorn all of our lawns in spring. That's not necessarily a good thing. It has 200 seeds per plant. The good news is it's shallow rooted and with just a little tugging, that is the sophisticated root system involved. Kids have a really good success with pulling these out, so I say busy hands are happy hands. Let's get our future gardeners out there. Let's move on to our next weed, which is black medic in the clover family. Most people note this by the small yellow flower that appears in spring. It has some positive benefits that it's re-entering nitrogen just the same way that you'd be entering a cover crop like the red clover as our winter cover crops. It's trying to do the same thing. Nature's trying to put the balance of nitrogen back into our soil. However, it is so compact in the middle and this mini taproot, a little struggle to get out. However, when you do, you can see that this sometimes stretches between six and 26 inches. Let's see if we can get one of those nodes. Uh, there'd be a nitrogen node right there. Trying to get that back in the soil and give you balance. But if we don't get it out in time, it's going to suffocate and not let our turf come back through it. So the important thing is to, by the time you're treating your lawn and getting a fertilizer in, that we've gotten these compact and suffocating weeds out. I also want to move to look at our next weed, which is the sow thistle also related to the dandelion. The sow thistle can be one that you'd be able to get with a lawnmower if you haven't had time to get down to the taproot. It is deeply rooted and you would need a tool to get that out. Um, the difference between a dandelion and the sow thistle is that it has several blooms on it. That means several seed pockets that will be floating in the air and replacing itself in the soil. The point I would love to get across is the most natural method of getting rid of weeds in your garden is to break the seed cycle. Another thing I'd like to say is when we get these weeds out, what do we do with them then? Can they just go into my compost? Well, the point being if we have an immature seed head, and that means it hasn't had its flower to seed process yet, you can put that into your compost, but my recommendation would be have a 24-hour to 48-hour period where it's not in and can break down. 
ideally it would be sun baking would be a great time to get it out there. Uh, not ideal for this week in Austin. Uh, but if it has a mature seed head, I would love to tell you that you could put that in your compost. However, I don't think you can get the heat that would need to break that down that it wouldn't be able to reproduce. So I hate to tell you, you're going to have to throw those out. Well, I've been Sweet Pea Hoover for Backyard Basics. Thank you for joining me. Remember, busy hands are happy hands, so get out there. And this is a great way to spend time in your garden. Watch online and get more tips at klru.org slash ctg. Next week, we look at alternatives to invasive plants. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg. Thank you.